Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 158, Finance Friday Edition, where we interview real estate agent Wayne Lux and talk about reevaluating a rental portfolio to generate more income and reevaluating W 2 employment to spend more time with the family. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen, and with me, as always, is my Excel spreadsheet loving co host, Scott Trench. I always love your formula for introductions, Mindy. <laughs> Thank you. Now my husband is putting garbage away and it's right behind the wall. Oh, I I'm going to shoot it. him it's dead. Right. I can't hear it. Oh, you can't? Mindy always, no, I can't hear it at all. Uh, Mindy always laughs at the uh, at, at those because Mindy will have one of those things and she'll say, hmm, maybe this would be a good pun. And I'm always like, I got I got I got a formula for that that Excel pun. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, I'm getting going with this, but we, we have. Uh, if I use her intro, she won't laugh as much. But if I if I give her a, a, a different, I don't know, a new pun on the spot, I get her going. But you are my Excel spreadsheet <laughs> loving coach. That's right, and you you do have a great formula for our introductions here. <laughs> You're always calculating new ones. Okay, Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else, and show you that by following the proven steps, you can put yourself on the road to early financial freedom and get money out of the way so you can lead your best life. That's right, whether you wanna retire early and travel to Maui, go on to make big time investments like in assets like real estate, start your own business, or simply just get a, get a, a grasp of what's next uh, in your already strong financial position, we'll help you build a position capable of launching yourself towards those dreams. Scott, I am super excited for today's episode of The Money Podcast because we are introducing a new day, a new episode. Every week, we are going to now come at you with two episodes, the Monday episode where we tell a money story and the Friday episode where we review someone's finances and give them tips and tricks for how they can work their finances better so they can reach financial independence. That's right. I'm really excited about the new the new format we've got here. Today, we're going to review Wayne Lux's financial position. And Wayne is either a millionaire or very close to it with a very high income and a lot of good problems there. It was really fun to, I think, point out some of the, the potential areas for leverage in his portfolio in life and what he can do to make the most of his really strong current financial position right now. Uh, I have a lot of fun with this. I'm really interested to see what Wayne does with the information that we discussed today. And I think you're going to learn a lot by reviewing his position and seeing what decisions he has to make. I completely agree. I love his story. I love that he has spent the last few years, maybe 10 years, steadily building a real estate portfolio. And now it's time to reevaluate that portfolio because it has increased so much in value. Um, and also reevaluate what's what he wants out of life. He has a brand new baby and he is excited to maybe step back from a W-2 job that takes time away from his family and spend more time getting to know his young sons. Scott, I just want to let you, uh, shit, okay. Scott, our attorney Matt makes me say the contents of this podcast are informational in nature and are not legal or tax advice, and neither Scott nor I nor Bigger Pockets is engaged in the provision of legal tax or any other advice. You should seek your own advice from professional advisors, including lawyers and accountants, regarding the legal, tax, and financial implications of any financial decision you contemplate. That's right. This Thanks, is Matt. just for fun. It's uh, informative, not informative. It's uh, entertainment purposes only. That's right. We're just you're just here for the jokes. Now, should we bring in Wayne and tell him what to do with his money? Wayne Lux, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast Finance Friday, first episode of the brand new year. I am so excited to talk to you because you have a situation that actually is not that uncommon, and a lot of other people are also in your financial situation. So I would love if you could give us a little bit of background on what you do and where your money's coming from. I appreciate it, Mindy and Scott. Um, yes, so I have uh, I've been a real estate agent since uh, 2006 uh, in the state of New Jersey, and um, I also help out a general contractor uh, in Manhattan uh, early in the the morning hours. Um, so I have the 1099 employment from the real estate, and then the W two from the general contracting. Um, so uh, we 
we tend to have a little bit of a security blanket with the W-2 employment. And then with the variable commission uh, driven business, you never know like what in during the month because, you know, with COVID especially, things are getting delayed and moved to different months. But uh, it's been very interesting to say the least. 2020 has been wild. What would you say your kind of stable uh, W-2 income is per month? Um, I would say it, it it does vary a little bit, but it's um, salary for right around like $4,000 net per month, um, right around there. Uh, that's a comfortable number. Okay, great. And then uh, how would you kind of say your, your real estate commissions come in? <laughs> Every year is different. This year has been um, very good. I, I can't complain. <laughs> Um, definitely one of the better years. I, I think we saw a lot of New York City transplants coming into the suburbs of Jersey. So um, definitely going to have an interesting ending to uh, 2020. So I want to I want to touch on this for a minute because I'm also an agent and I have also had a wild year. Um, I have sold more real estate this year than I have ever in my life, and it's insane. I am de- I am closing five properties this month which wow. is Fantastic. not, I have a full-time job. So that's like, <laughs> I have two full-time jobs now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys so, have been cool. I know it's, it's, it's a wild ride. But what are you doing with all of the money that comes in? Uh, so thankfully, uh, my wife and I, uh, we made some big moves in 2020. Uh, March 10th, we actually closed on our new primary residence um, in a town that we wanted to raise our two kids. Uh, and the house that we moved to actually has sort of an ADU set up in the back of the property. So that cut down our living expenses quite a bit. Um, and then we were pretty intense with saving for a vehicle for her, got rid of leases. Um, so we bought her car outright. So we've been saving for, um, other investment properties. We've been saving for, our kids college, we've been saving just for our general, like my SEP IRA. Um, So we've been putting money aside for certain buckets and doing a better job starting around like 2019, we really got a budget down. And then 2020, we're we're just hitting it hard. And as of, geez, I think it's been since late September, we've been more focused on going after paying off our lowest uh, income producing property just to get that mortgage paid for because COVID was a real eye opener for us to get a paid for property that has the rental income uh, that maybe if my wife wants to step away from her job, she could do that later on. So, And what does your wife do? How much does she make? She is a uh, department chair for a uh, board of education in New Jersey and um, she, or for a school uh, township, I should say. And uh, she's a little over six figures. Awesome. And so what does your expense situation look like? Uh, well, thankfully, we, we cut that down quite a bit. Our, our mortgage, after we received the rent from uh, the, the tenant, we pay about $2,500. Um, and then... We have no car payments right now. We have um, only one vehicle because my wife is actually on maternity leave because we got our second kid in May. As I said, 2020 was wild. So Congrats. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, and now we're, we're focusing on getting that property paid off. I do have to purchase a vehicle in I'd say a month or so, but I've also socked a few dollars away for that. So uh, expenses wise, just utilities. Um, and I think our credit card debt that we took on when we purchased this home for a few remodels, we threw it on a zero month, uh, 18 month, 0% interest for, I think it's like seven grand, which I mean, I could pay that off any day. So it's right now our expenses are practically nothing, which is fantastic. Yeah. You have a, a solid mortgage expense there, but you're, that's not, it's not very significant relative to your household income here. Correct. Um, yeah. So you've got you've got an ama- a, a large ability to to accumulate cash based on what I'm I'm understanding about your financial position on on a monthly basis. Sometimes a lot, but almost <laughs> every month you're going to be able to accumulate. You know, even even in a month we have no commissions, you're going to be uh, accumulating a good a good chunk of cash. Yes. Um, thankfully, we've we've kind of positioned our our lifestyle now 
to to go ahead and just start saving a heck of a lot more. And that's kind of where I'm I'm not at a loss, but I definitely want to focus on either filling more buckets or going gazelle intense on paying off the property um, because COVID definitely threw some curveballs our way. Awesome. So, so, okay, go ahead, Mindy. I was going to ask, are all of your properties located in New Jersey? I have, yes, uh, predominantly, uh, yeah, I have, um, I have 11 doors technically, and then a couple garages that we rent out, but um, the 10 out of the 11 are in New Jersey. One is in Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, because New Jersey has a pretty interesting rental law that you can't just kick somebody out. Yes. It's very, you have to uh, give them the option. Yes. It's very tough uh, to be a landlord in the state of New Jersey. But um, so far, I've been very fortunate with some really good tenants. Um, and, you know, COVID did delay a few rental payments here and there. Uh, but we're working with them. And, you know, having the higher income, thankfully, we've been able to cover them for the most part. Um, so it's been it's been pretty good overall. And uh, the cash flow from that, from those properties, pretty much covers my mortgage payment as well. So we're able to, I mean, put a lot of money away if we wanted to. Awesome. So, so it sounds like you've got a really strong financial position. You make a lot more than you spend. You've got a significant portfolio of assets. You've got, you know, how, can you give us a little uh, understanding about how that portfolio in particular is capitalized, uh, debt and equity, and then your, your cash reserves? Sure. Um, so cash reserves, uh, up until about 2019, we were very, very light on keeping cash reserves. We've built that up a little bit more. Um, thankfully, because of COVID, it, it's amplified that. Um, then we are huge proponents for uh, lines of credit. Um, we tend to credit card hack quite a bit and get out to Maui as much as possible, believe it or not. Um, and then with the lines of credit, if we ever need to, we ever need to you know, access something, we have that available to take care of any repair. But we're trying to keep about I'd say five to ten thousand per property, just to you know keep us in a safe zone. Great. So you've got access. You you got a very well capitalized portfolio with all that. Any other assets to, of note? Um, so my wife and I we've been um, we've been pretty good with contributing to our four hundred one ks, four hundred three bs, SEP IRAs. Um, I opened up a Vanguard recently. She has a Vanguard account we put some money aside and then i um i've been dabbling in like robin hood here and there just that's kind of just like play money on the side but um yeah that in total we're probably pushing about 550 550 000 in in all combined uh retirement accounts great and then you have a, a cash reserve for your personal life outside of the rental property and, and how much is that relative to your monthly spend uh whew, um Couple months, I'd, or yeah. I'd say, yeah, I'd say it's probably about ten months worth. All right, so you you got a rock solid financial foundation. This is what I think a lot of people aspire to. Um, you know, when they're setting out in their personal finance journeys, you, you're you've got a, a significant cash reserve, a, a buffer there. You've got uh, multiple sources of income. You've got multiple uh, multiple investment, you know, inv investments that you're you're attacking here. What's mm -hmm. the, what's the biggest challenge you've got here and how can we help you? Uh, biggest challenge was, I mean, up until last month, I really haven't been focused on filling certain buckets. I, I would love to hear your guys' input as to what you would do moving forward with, I mean, come December, we're going to have three incomes. So that's going to change the numbers again. And, you know, we're going to be able to, you know, manipulate things a little differently. Um, and you know, should I be focused on getting that one property paid off? Should I dump more money into my SEP IRA for come tax season? There's, there's so many different options and, um, yeah, I, I would just love to pick your brain about where, where would you go, uh, given the situation. And I, I know Scott, you're getting married soon, so you're going to have that dual income situation coming in. So it's, mm -hmm. it's going to be nice. No, absolutely. So first question I'd have for you there is, is a general, you know, and I'll try to, to, to help narrow this down a little bit. So it's not so wide here, but like a general, what do you want? How do you want to be spending your time? When do you want that by? 
And, you know, like, for example, are you looking for a way to kind of just maximize your lifestyle right away? Or are you, are you thinking, you know what, I'm, I'm enjoying this. I want to, I want to put more time in and make more money and build up a bigger nest egg and enjoy that a little bit later, you know, in a five-year time frame. What, how does that, how are you kind of thinking about that? It's a phenomenal question because I, I have two young kids, two young sons, one's three and one's six months. Um, I love the time that I had with them during COVID. And I think um, I'd like to gain my mornings back. Um, so probably getting rid of the W-2 job in the morning would be my, my first goal. Um, do I necessarily need to pay off the property before then? Probably not. I could probably pull that trigger right now. But there's some level of comfort knowing that I have you know, a little bit more stable income when, God forbid, the market does turn like I've seen it. Okay. So I'm more of a don't ever pay off your mortgage person because know, yeah. right now we've got super low interest rates and you've yes. got sub 5%, sub 4.5% on all of your mortgages. Yeah. Um, so what we did instead of paying off our mortgage was save up that amount of money and okay. put it in uh, an easily liquidatable fund. So like a high interest, high, high yield savings account in <laughs> quotes, cause they're like 0.8%. I know. Um, yeah. Just so we could have it and pay it off if we needed to. Okay. But then we still have the mortgage, so we don't have that money gone, essentially. Sure. So um, that's something that you can do or consider doing. You know, of course, speak to your wife because having you both on the same page is the best advice ever. Absolutely. Um, I, I have a couple other questions, though, about your financial situation. Does your wife have opportunity to contribute to a 457 plan? Um, I believe she does. I got to look into that. She um, she has been employed at this position for about three years. I think she was able to when she was a teacher, but now she's at the administration level. So I'm not 100% sure if she uh, does have that option, but certain, certainly something to look into. That is an even better option because that those funds are uh, they reduce your taxable income and who wants right. to pay more taxes than they have to. They, uh, once you separate from employment, she's able to get access to those funds with no penalties. I think she has to pay taxes on it. You definitely want to speak to a CPA about this, but, okay. or I'm sorry, a tax professional about this. It doesn't have to be a CPA, uh, but she won't pay any fees to access those funds, which is nice. You said that she might eventually separate from employment. That is kind of like the best of both worlds. You reduce yeah. your taxable income, but you don't have to wait until you're 59 and a half to access the funds. So I would definitely work on uh, or look into the 457 plan and see if that's available to her. You said that you have a SEP IRA mm -hmm. and I'm wondering why you chose a SEP IRA over a self-directed solo 401k. Do you have full-time employees other than your wife? Um, no, I don't um, actually. So my tech account suggested the SEP back, uh, God, probably seven years ago, um, and just kind of rolled with it back then. Um, somebody else asked me the same question, why not do the solo? So um, another option for me, I can definitely try and look into that a little bit more. Um, what was I going to say? So I'm just writing this all down for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We're recording this, so you can listen to it again. <laughs> but so with this, ways. Go ahead. do you use your SEP IRA to invest in real estate? Uh, I have not. No. Okay. Uh, yeah. I have not utilized any retirement accounts to invest in real estate. It definitely could be an option. When I zoom out and look at your financial position, it sounds like most of your time is going to generating that $4,000 a month in income from your contractor job. Is that, is that correct? Um, it's a good mix. Uh, I, I definitely say that I spend an even amount of time with real estate and the general contracting company. Um, and, and how much time are you spending on that W con the W two contractor job? It, it varies. Pre COVID, it was busier. Um, now my my mornings are a little bit lighter, so I start very early in the morning, usually about like four forty five, and then uh, I've got about an hour commute into Manhattan, and then I'm out any any given day. It could be ten thirty up to about one o'clock, but thankfully, real estate most of the time doesn't really kick in until the you know mid afternoons. Okay. So this is a, a, uh, eight hour a day job, 
basically that you're you're getting this for for, for about four thousand a month, and and is that what you're is that right? Yeah, net four, net four. Okay, after tax, you're saying? Yeah. You know that that I think I think that's probably if I'm if I'm zooming out and looking at your overall situation, you're a millionaire or close to it. Um, with between your real estate equity and the investments you just described in your cash position. You, you have a household income well into the six figures and those types of things. Mm-hmm. Your time is extremely valuable. Absolutely. And working a full-time job for $70,000 a year, you know, it seems like a, non, a non-scalable option to me looking at this when your real estate income is this high and you've got other opportunities with those types of things. So I'm not saying like, go out and quit your job tomorrow and think about it, but I would, I would approach your situation with that framework in mind. You know, yeah. if, if, if you're a millionaire I, I, with that kind of stuff and your household income is, I don't know, 200, making this up 200, 250 a year, right? That, that puts the dollar value of your time at like $125 an hour. Um, you know, well, I mean, I, I guess, maybe half of that between you and your wife, but like you have those options and those types of things. And so what I would be doing is I would be thinking like, that's, is that scalable? Am I going to be generating a lot more income from that job in the next year or two? And if so, maybe that's worth it. If not, maybe I got to refocus on my real estate business or something scalable here because you guys can easily get by on one income right now. You can, you could probably retire frankly, pr- are pretty close to it. You know, with you probably you probably want a little bit more padding based on what we know emotively of our of our, our listeners and financial positions to permanently retire with that. But I think I think that's the the central problem that I'm sem- if I'm looking at the 80-20 rule, your time is being spent four o'clock in the morning till at least 10 o'clock or one o'clock in the, the afternoon mm-hmm. on this job. Um, that I don't think is, is, I think it's a a scalability problem that you're facing right now. What do you think? What's your reaction to that statement? I totally agree. Um, you know, it wasn't that obvious to me pre COVID. Um, I, I definitely valued my time with my family when there was the shutdown in, in New York city. Um, and I completely agree. Just a little backstory. The owner is my father-in-law of the company. So I do have a little bit of, you know, uh, Never mind. It's completely scalable. <laughs> believe me, I don't. I don't want to go that route. But um, you know, I'm also doing him a favor by helping him and his company. Uh, and it's it does have its perks. I mean, we've uh, had many many vacations paid for from all the um, expenses that we've used for the company. So travel hacking. I mean, we've gone so many places thanks to the business. So there's a little bit of of that element that kind of keeps me, you know, second guessing leaving. But um, you're absolutely right. I, I've thought I could be using utilizing my time in so many different ways. And it's it's in the near future. I've had the conversation where I'm probably going to be scaling back that line of work uh, at least three days, maybe four days a week instead of the five. And then um, eventually just phase it out because we've put ourselves into this position as of 2020. Pretty much we've got our our budget and our expenses down to something that's extremely manageable. No, I, I love it. And, and look, I think, I think what's awesome is we've had a lot of folks who really struggle to get into a position where they're able to earn that kind of income, but because, you're, because of your situation, I think that you've, to me, it sounds like you're, you're beginning, you're on the cusp of having outgrown that. If you're looking for like the next steps there, you, you've got a, a, large and growing and scaling real estate business. You've got a variable, you can afford to focus more heavily on the variable income that you're earning with the real estate commissions um, because you've got that stability from your wife's employment to, to cover what looks like household expenses, which mm-hmm. you, you may not even, yeah. And if even if both of those dry up entirely for 10 months, you've got 10 months of emergency cash reserve in the cushion. So your, your position is so well capitalized that I think it's just about the obvious in, in the sense of like, how do I, where, where's my ROI and my time coming from? And if that ROI is not above a, a, a set level that you think is acceptable, which I would peg at a hundred to $125 an hour in your situation, frankly, mm-hmm. uh, I wouldn't do it uh, anymore. 
Well, there is the added wrinkle that it's his father-in-law. So I would, yeah. uh, I, I, which you I, didn't say at first. I 100% get that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there, so, there's, a, there's a backstory. I proposed to my, uh, you know, at the time girlfriend, which obviously is my wife now. And I think that night he was like, you're going to come work for me. So it was definitely like one of those, <laughs> like, sure, you can have her hand, but you're, you're going to, you know, come work in Manhattan. So, uh, so is there, uh, so you said you might want to scale that back and that was going to be my suggestion. My husband eventually retired, but when he was, uh, still working, he's like, I don't want to just cut the cord completely. Can I go part-time? And his office was like, sure, we don't care. Okay. Like it was, it was a lot of anxiety for him, I think, to uh, talk to them about it and to, you know, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then when he finally did it, they're like, fine, whatever. Like, that was, awesome. yeah. that was so, a conversation about two weeks ago. It was like, I'm going to scale back on the time. And they were like, okay, that's fine. So great. Well, well what's happening though, is, is he's getting this skill set of a millionaire business owner for 50 grand a year, you know, net, you know, whatever it is. Right. And so that, that's great. And I, I understand that, that dynamic, but I think that if, if, if I'm thinking through your situation, I would be thinking about how do I fairly and amicably um, begin the process of finding a, a, a good solution here? Because the reality is you're just going to be more valuable uh, to, I, I, I would imagine without knowing anything else, just by hearing your position, how you handle your business and your affairs, I have to imagine that you're a valuable employee. So lots of compliments flowing your way, uh, you know, with, with all that. But, you know, I imagine that that's, that's going to be a central problem for your, your father-in-law, the business owner, in the sense that, that you probably provide a good value there. So some solution, if I'm just thinking through the problem, beginning to articulate it that way, one solution that potentially presents itself is finding a succession plan there to, you know, who is somebody who really wants that job, who can afford to give more time and will go all into it, who, because it really is their opportunity to grow. How do we, how do we find that person and groom them potentially to begin taking that over for you? Uh, that's a, that's a great question. I think that there is one gentleman who could take that position, but he's already pressed. He does not want the role. And, um, so it's a work in progress, definitely. Uh, we'll, we'll see when the time comes. If I do want to ramp it up and say, hey, listen, I, I want to cut this out completely, then we're going to have a different conversation. But, um, you know, it's in the works, I would say. Yeah. And, and, and you never know how that conversation can go because maybe maybe there's something, maybe there's a bigger opportunity there. Maybe that, maybe once the problem is exposed and it's very politely and professionally and understanding the dynamics between, you know, of the family. The family mm -hmm. dynamics there. Maybe there's a way to have that conversation productively um, where you say, look, I, for me, it's not scalable given my position anymore. You know, mm -hmm. you could even share this, this podcast potentially and say, look, I didn't say it. Scott said it <laughs> right? <laughs> with, with this. Oh, you know, here, here, here's the, here's the, you know, here's the situation as I'm seeing it right now. And I just, I'm wondering if there's a better way to, to spend my time here. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a chance to, um, you know, uh, take a even more significant role in operations if that's something that you wanted or begin scaling back or, or whatever. But the current status quo, I think, I think that's the elephant in the room in your financial position right now. Yeah, I 110% agree. Um, the timing of everything has been probably the biggest struggle only because my wife has been out for the past six months for on maternity leave. So, you know, having just the two incomes right now, we kind of dipped our toes into the new lifestyle and the new house and tried to navigate COVID with all of our tenants. And um, so things are, the dust is settling, I would say. And it's definitely within the next, you know, couple of weeks to months where something's going to happen, whether it's going to be one of us moves from, you know, our position. So. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Beyond beyond that particular problem, what are some, are there any other big challenges that you're facing around around that? Um, hmm. COVID has thrown so many curveballs. We we owned a previous house that we it was our primary residence. Um, we ended up having to give seller financing to that um, to that purchaser because of they were trying to close right at the end of March, early April. And um, they couldn't get financing because banks were tightening up a little bit. So we have some money tied up in another property. Um, would love to know your thoughts on potentially 
somehow trying to get those funds out of there sooner because it's a three-year balloon uh, with a 30-year amortization. So I don't mind being the the bank for that for him, but I would love to gain access to those funds to invest a little bit more um, sooner. That's for sure. So you're the debt holder Correct. on on how much? Uh, that property he owes one ninety on. So you you're owed one hundred ninety thousand at four percent interest, and you're not going to get that back until three years from now. Yeah, we're about two. We're about seven months into it. Has he tried to refinance? I asked him a million times to try and refinance, and he's like, I, "Money's just so cheap right now." He just didn't want to do it, and I kept saying, "Almost like, you know, you can even get lower than the four percent. Why not take that opportunity?" He just doesn't seem to be uh, motivated. Do you have any power to enforce that, or are you, is it just kind of like, uh, is it more uh, you're gonna have to use diplomacy here and get him to want to do it? Yeah, I think I think B. I think he's just going to want to or need to, you know, have that push or some some reason to. I think uh, I think beyond your your push of just like, you know, look, I'm going to call the entire note due in three <laughs> years when it comes due. You know, you can either have that looming over your head or you can refinance while the sun shines and the interest rates low. Yeah, if he's not motivated, unless it's worth it to you to financially incentivize him to speak to a lender and get that going, um, he's, I mean, what is his reason to, I, I would just want to, because I don't want a balloon coming up. In three years, rates could be 5% or more, probably not, but they could be. Yeah. For those listening, by the way, a balloon payment is when you have a, a, a mortgage. And in this case, uh, he's, he's pay, the, the, the borrower is paying interest only, it sounds like, for three years. After three years, the entire $190,000 balance um, will, will be due to wane here, right? And so that, that's what a balloon payment is, as opposed to a, a traditional mortgage that amortizes over time. You pay off the entire mortgage over the, over the period. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what is he, what are his plans when he doesn't have that $190,000 in one lump sum? He's an independent contractor. So I think he was going to take um, like a line of credit out on his business or some type of credit line from his business um, to pay it off. I, why, I don't know. He's just trading. You need to talk to him because he yeah, needs I, to, for another, yeah. he needs to hear this too. Wait, I, I, I think, I think this was a bad loan on your part, frankly, uh, with okay. this because, because, uh, the in when you with get what I'm with, I'm putting myself in his shoes. He's paying four percent interest only, um, for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. That's a really light payment, and he's and some people I don't know this person, but some people are of that mindset of like, oh wow, like I could either pay four percent, which is nothing, probably like a few hundred bucks a month at most, right? Mm -hmm. Um, or finding out a convention. Oh. You know, or or, or eleven hundred or twelve hundred on this thing. It's, That's it's uh it's roughly a thousand. It's it's oh so he yeah. is you are amortizing the loan. Yes, I, I over thirty years. I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I don't know. Okay, by that. I'm sorry. I thought it was interest only. No, it's no, not no. that bad of a loan. Then sorry. Uh, sorry for my, I, I retract what I said earlier. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that then, because uh, I was in my head. I'm saying I thought it was a pretty good deal because he was not getting financing at the hour with uh, the way the pandemic was moving at that time. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that could an interest only could be demotivating. But in this case, I just think you're the bank at a four percent interest loan, and the difference between you and a traditional bank is you can't just go and sell this loan on the mortgage market because it's not a you know it doesn't check every box on the conventional mortgage market. So it's a little bit more risky for you. Yeah. Um, maybe in the future you charge a higher interest rate to compensate for that. But in the meantime, I don't think you have much leverage in in arbitraging this particular the particular money you have tied up there. I would say I would try one more attack with him and just say, you know, you don't know what's going to happen in three years. You don't know where we're going to be. You don't know where lending is going to be right now. Interest rates are ridiculously low. Yeah. And, you know, you don't he doesn't know where his business is going to be in three years. True. Very true. Why would he risk? I mean, did he give any sort of down payment on this property? Uh, yeah, it was a hefty down payment, which basically took care of the entire mortgage, the commissions, all the fees. So it was it was large enough that. I felt comfortable moving forward with, you know. Yeah. So he's risking that down payment. Yeah. He's risking a lot. 
you're in a really defensible position. You're not going to lose a lot of money, I don't think, in the situation. But you're 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 not going to be able to get access to that to um, generate a higher return than four percent. It sounds like for the exactly. foreseeable future. Yes, exactly. And I would love to, you know, utilize that in a different way at this point, but unfortunately, you know, it's kind of tied up. Yeah. What would you, what would you do with the money if you, if you had access to it? Uh, probably out of state investing, um, the prices for multifamilies, I, I'm a buy and hold investor. So I'd be looking for something out of state at this time. Okay. So, so your, your intention with investing is not to be, um, passive in the sense that you're going to invest in, you know, really dump more money into the stock market or index funds. You want to go more into real, more heavily into real estate and get that a little bit better of a return. I've, yeah, I've had a little bit more better, you know, better returns with real estate over the last, um, oh my God, since uh, 2007 uh, was when I bought my first property. So um, I definitely focus a little bit more on that in in that realm, but um, definitely out of state. You've been investing since 2007. Let me ask you a little bit about your current portfolio. Sure. Um, how what, would you say that you have a lot of properties that have appreciated significantly um, in your portfolio? Two of the five or six properties, I would say, have seen greater appreciation because we purchased them around 2007, 2008. Um, and then the rest was thanks to you guys, actually, because Bigger Pockets was introduced to me by um, a, a friend of mine and a co- colleague. Um, and she said, you got to listen to them because you're doing everything that they do, but you're, you know, you don't have any real focus right now. Um, and the, I guess it was Mindy, I think it was when you were doing the podcast with Beardy Brandon. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you were covering for somebody at the time or if you were the co-host at the time, but that's pretty much when I dove into the podcast. Uh, I was covering for Josh Dorkin, who okay. eventually stepped away, and we replaced him with David. But we didn't have a replacement, so what I jumped year, in any what chance year I could. Was that out of curiosity? Uh, was that 2017, Scott, or 2018? I think it was 17. Yeah, I think yeah, it was 17. 17 sounds good. 17 is yeah, because 17, I started listening to you guys, and I bought another multi, and then went on to do uh, a flip. You guys really motivated me, and and um, you know, I I can't thank you guys enough for just lighting a fire under me. Well, nice. Well, well, congratulations. You, you, you applied that to some astounding success here and have a lot of really good options um, in your life with, with uh, the reason I was asking about the properties is, could you give me one example of a property that you've owned that's appreciated considerably and what is your mortgage balance and what's the equity balance on that, uh, that, that property? Um, okay. So one, two family, uh, in Jersey was uh, purchased for two sixty five um, back in, I think it was 2010. Um, needed some work about $25,000 worth of work. We could probably sell that right now for about 475, maybe 500. Cause the, uh, the market has definitely increased rental income on that is roughly around 3,300 a month. Um, mortgage payments about 2000 and our equity. I think we only owe 151,000 on it, something like that. Great. So let's say let's call it five hundred and uh, of of value and one hundred and fifty in debt. That gives you three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in equity. Yes. Now, this is a, a great problem to have, and a problem that a lot of investors, including myself, have yes. uh, right now, which is where you have too much equity relative to debt. Real estate, on average, returns worse than the stock market without the use of leverage. Right? Uh, returns yes, worth. Absolutely. What? What's that? No, no, I said, absolutely. You're right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So what I would do is I would take that property and others like it in your portfolio and I would run them through, you know, I'll, I'll plug our bigger pockets calculators here. I'd run them through the bigger pockets calculators and I'd say, what does my five-year return look like mm-hmm. if I'm purchasing this property today with zero closing costs because I already own it, those types of things, cool. right? Mm-hmm. And what does my return look like over the next five years? And what happens to my return if I pull out a significant chunk of cash, still maintaining my overall conservative bent on my overall financial position that you've done a great job with, mm-hmm. you know, but but if I find a way to capitalize just a little bit more actively, what does that look like? I bet you that you jump from a, a 10-ish percent compound return over the next couple of years to a, a 18 to 20 um, depending on, on how things go and how you, what, what assumptions you use there. 
I, I'm, it's funny you ask or funny you say that because I am in the middle of uh, trying to get a line of credit from one of our properties to try and you know leverage it a little bit. So um, a lot of the banks, unfortunately, have tightened up that process and um, we're working directly. I think TD is one of the only bigger ones that are, are handling uh, HELOCs at the moment. So yeah. Um, so, so what I did recently is I, I just straight up cash out refinanced. I did it okay. on two of my properties that had that 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 situation. And I'm going to find a way to deploy that cash. Uh, the second loan will, will close in the next uh, three or four weeks here. I'm going to find a way to deploy that cash going forward. But that's how I'm handling the situation is with the, the straight up cash out refi, because I lock in that lower rate for, I, I just, I'm literally refinancing at a lower rate. My payment's yeah. only going up by a few hundred bucks in aggregate. And I'm getting access to all this additional cash that I think I can find reasonable ways to deploy. So it's about being conservative with that. That's an aggressive overall stance, but under but underlying that is my holistic conservative financial position with a strong cash buffer and those types of things. But I think that's probably your other big leverage point in your existing portfolio um, is, is thanks to that great problem you have of buying a property so many years ago, experiencing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of appreciation, and now being inefficient as a result thanks to a really good problem. Yeah, it, it definitely is a good problem to have. Um, I guess my only my only concern would be, um, again, going back to these COVID conditions with tenants and being reliable on payments and stuff like that to take on further debt and stuff like and to take on and leverage that property. Maybe I don't want to do that with all of them, but one could certainly change my return. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's just, a, that's a personal preference thing. It's, it's, yeah. it's a way to drive returns with yes. the, the, uh, incremental risk and it's completely personal preference. You have no bad options where, as it comes to your real estate portfolio, thanks to, you know, a, a decade of smart investing. So that's, that's a really nice problem to have. You have no bad options. I'm going to throw out a different option. Okay. I want to challenge you to go back and really review the numbers on your property. Okay. $3,300 a month in rent on a purchase price of 280 is fabulous, but $3,300 a month in rent on a value of 485 isn't as best, isn't as good as you could be doing. So go back and review. Are there five properties for 11 units total? There are, yeah, there are five total uh, properties and 11 doors and a couple garages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't think that the property that used to be your primary residence is um, available for a 1031 exchange because you bought it as a primary residence. But the mm -hmm. other ones that you purchased as an investment property, if the numbers no longer make sense, sure. consider using a 1031 exchange to take that money, take it maybe out of a less landlord friendly state and mm -hmm. move it to a slightly more landlord friendly state where you can decide to not renew leases on somebody who maybe isn't your favorite tenant. It's a great idea. I've, I've always kind of flown solo uh, with my investing. I've, I have a couple of business partners, but out of state investing, yeah, I would definitely have to start networking and getting a feel for different uh, areas. And I mean, what better place to do it than on BP? So I've, I've been looking uh, just not as aggressive. Wow. If only there was a book called The Long Distance Real Estate Investor, Scott. <laughs> That's right. Wayne, yeah. do you have a copy of that book? I I believe I am not a reader. I am an audible listener. So I probably downloaded that. I definitely have Scott's on there. I have a couple others of the BP uh, books, but I'm not 100% sure if I have. No, I do. Well, if you, David Green. Well, say, You've got that if you one. don't, okay. we'll, we'll go ahead and send you one. But, I appreciate um, that. Yeah, I do have it. Uh, that's an excellent book. And I would definitely... Uh, read that, start looking at other markets. You had mentioned investing out of state. Mm -hmm. If you've got all this money just sitting there in these real estate deals, you have to make a smart choice, make a smart purchase. Don't sell them before you've got something else to buy. Absolutely. Uh, the 1031 can be, it's got a lot of rules involved in it. For those of you who are listening who haven't participated in this, a 1031 exchange is when you have purchased a property as an investment. You decide that you want to buy another investment property. You sell this one. You don't pay any capital gains taxes if you follow all of the rules surrounding the 1031 exchange. You essentially kick the tax can down the road. So this is a great way to sell these properties, buy new ones, and not have to pay taxes or do any of those awful things. Uh, but 
please connect with a qualified intermediary before you do anything with your 1031 exchange because, like I said, there are a lot of rules. And if you miss just one, all of your 1031 exchange bonuses are gone and then you owe a lot of taxes. Yeah. So so another way to think about that is to say, hey, I'm buying this property for $500,000 with $350,000 down. Mm -hmm. What could I do alternatively to that and run those analyses in parallel? Understand it's not 350, it's, it's, you know, 325 or whatever it is after closing costs, your closing costs being a little lower, I imagine, because exactly. you would facilitate the sale as an agent. I, um, other listening to this and you're not an agent, you'll have to higher closing costs than Wayne here, but that's another big advantage to that. And I think, I think, yeah, that's the, you know, that, that's the, in terms of your assets, um, that's, that's where I think the leverage will be right now is in ex re-examining your existing portfolio, acknowledging your wonderful set of problems, and then just deciding, Hey, do I just want to pay off the debt? And I'm fine with like, you know, pretty mediocre returns, but complete freedom and stability with that. Or am I looking, you know, is that something, am, am I interested in, in driving higher returns and rethinking my overall strategy with that? But just know those numbers, stare at them and, yeah. and the decision will become a little more helpful, I think. I totally agree. And uh, it's great advice. I will certainly sit down and re, you know, revisit those numbers. Great. Well, well, to me, those appear to become some of the big uh, uh, items in your financial position is is the job and and the the allocation of capital that you've got within your real estate portfolio right now. Did we miss anything, or or is there something else you'd like to discuss? Uh, I'm looking at my list right now. I mean, you know, you definitely answered a few of my questions as far as you know where you would go, and then I knew you guys kind of were going to lean towards leveraging more more of my equity and uh, purchasing properties. Um, Curious what the community would say as far as being within this this COVID realm and uh, whether paying off one would be a little bit better just to have a little bit of a comfort level. But I I, I do see the value in leveraging and, and just going so much further with it. So, um, yeah, I'll probably just have to go that route and revisit the numbers. Well, well, let's do this. You've already shared a lot of the numbers here. Sure. What if we, what if we just, what if we say when this episode releases, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and have a forum thread on the bigger pockets, uh, on bigger pockets. We'll pin it and see if we can't get some, some investors to chime in on, on your set of good problems. I think a lot of people have the same set of issues that you're having right now. I've passively, not passively, but I've slowly and maybe not completely intentionally as a business acquired a portfolio of properties that have gone through the roof in value. And sure. now I'm like moderately rich, but I don't know exactly how to to leverage that for what I want in life completely that's right cool. now. That that's I think I think we'll get a lot of good feedback. I think you'll get some people saying, no, let's pay them down. And I think you'll get some people that say lever leverage them you know, re-leverage them, keep doing what you're doing. I'm, I'm interested. I have no idea, actually. I'm interested to see what the community will have to say about that. Yeah. I think it's a great idea to just throw it out there. I mean, you know, a lot of the listeners are probably Dave Ramsey listeners also. So they'd probably say pay it off. And, you know, I've went down that rabbit hole of all different podcasts and sure. I, I, I <laughs> would love to have paid for properties and have the cash flow. Uh, but you can, you can just grow so much more and, uh, if I had a little bit more time on my hands with without that job, yeah, I might be able be able to, you know, go out of state and see some other opportunities out there. I think those two are directly those two items are going to be directly linked in your in whatever path you decide going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, and this is more of a Wayne should think about it than Mindy needs to know the exact dollar amount answer. But I'm curious what portion of your expenses mm -hmm. are covered. Once you have no mortgages on your rental properties and the current rental properties and the amount of money that they're bringing in. Um, uh, at that point, if I have, I, I would say I would be able to have um, two to three properties paid off. If two or three properties were paid off, I'd have enough to cover our monthly expenses um, and then we would just be saving everything that we, we earn. So, okay. uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, probably three, three properties. I, I really like that as a framework, 
That is a great, I think that's a great question, Mindy. And I think that's a great, a great, another piece of data there. Hey, what if, what if it's, I'm going to just, in if, I'm going to create an inefficient portfolio that gives me complete peace of mind. And then with the rest of it, I'm going to capitalize it for long-term value creation. That mm-hmm. might be a great middle ground. That's actually a noodle for myself. Um, and, 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 you know, cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of appeal to something like that. Um, the expense, of course, at a portion of your portfolio may be underappreciating over the next 10, 20, 30 years. But the sure. the benefit is complete freedom to exercise. You go after some big bets, for example, with your time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think my wife uh, having these past six months with our second son would absolutely love to, you know, gain a little bit more time with the family. And so to have some expenses covered would easily open that door for her and um, yeah, that would be something I'd love to do for her. Yeah, that's another. That's a whole other one to to think about there. I love it. I want to suggest a money date with your wife. Yeah, uh, where you sit down and the kids are asleep, or they're at a babysitter. You're out to dinner, or you're locked in the car with her. And the kids are asleep in the back. Yeah. Um, to suggest a money date where you sit down and you lay it all out. So, you know, do a little preparation when you are getting ready for this, have all the numbers, have all of the, you know, look into other, other uh, states that you might want to invest in. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've got, you know, $2 million worth of real estate in New Jersey. And if we took this money and did a 1031 exchange to, you know, Kansas City, we could buy a 35 unit apartment complex and cover all of our expenses plus all of those expenses and never have to work another day again or, you know, whatever. I, I made that up. Don't quote me on that. But <laughs> oh, <Lord. laughs> for anybody listening, find us that deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want that deal too. Yeah. But, you know, do a little bit of research into the different areas if you've got more than one state that you're interested in mm-hmm. and just see what's available, what's a good idea. I can't get a 35-unit apartment complex in Manhattan for $2 million, um, right? I, w- I would want that. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe in Kansas City, that's an option, or maybe it's $3 million, or maybe you could take on a little bit more debt combined with all the properties that you have and really have a super awesome deal in the works um, that could, the argument for multifamily is that when you've got one unit vacant in a single family home, you have zero income. But when you have one unit out of 35, you still have 34, 35th income coming in and that's just better. And, and, And maybe there's a way to think about, hey, I can take on more financial risk if I'm going to reduce operational risk by freeing up my time to work on that project, right? So there's a whole whole d- bunch of different options there along the lines that Mindy is discussing. But again, I think I I, I love that we we got a chance to discuss the the job thing because I think that whatever you decide there is going to be, I think that's going to be a a, a, a huge component of that and something to to bring up. Uh, I think a money date is the perfect way to bring that up actually because of the the context we discussed earlier. <laughs> She, she's been uh, she's been a strong advocate for me to to take more time away from that business, uh, which is her father's business. But um, yeah, she's she's definitely on board with it. We've had a couple money dates. Um, she is definitely more of like the visual learner, so she um, needed some some charts and graphs and some things to color in to make it exciting for her because you know um, she wasn't really into the podcast and, and all the numbers, but I, I can definitely have another money day with her and say, let's scale out one, six months to a year. Where do we want our life to be? And I think it's a great, great way to bring it up. Well, we'll try to, I would, I, if that's the case, uh, I'll plug it one more time here. Uh, I don't usually do this at the show. So, uh, but it, look, try the bigger pockets calculators. If you're not a pro, we'll, we'll go ahead and give you access to them um, for, for period, however long you need to, to make that happen. But go ahead and try those out and use, they, I think that, that visualizing what that's going to look like to your financial position and the returns you can get by making those changes, I think that will be helpful as part of that because I think that's, a, that's the most leverage you have right now in terms of your assets. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Okay, Scott, let's recap what it is that we are suggesting Wayne do. Number one, review all of the finances on the properties that you own. 
and make sure that they still make sense. Some of them still might make sense, and that's awesome. Make sure you've got the right amount of rent that you are charging your tenants. Make sure that you have tenants that you really want to keep. Make sure the properties are properties that make sense financially. And like Scott said, run them through the Bigger Pockets calculators, which can be found at biggerpockets.com slash calc. The, the second thing is to determine the dollar value of your time and your wife's time. Mm -hmm. And be, create an exit plan from activities that you do not enjoy, which earn below that threshold, right? Yeah. Perhaps including your job. I think that's the second key there is you guys need to agree on that. That's a great money date topic. You say, here's what I think, what should I narrow it down to? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's, that's going to be a huge conversation. Yeah. And tagging on Scott, number three is have a money date with your wife. Put out all the numbers. This is what everything means. This is where we are. This is where we want to be. And here's my plan to get there. Or, you know, what do you think? Here's a couple of ideas. What are your, what are your choices or what are your uh, thoughts on those? Because when you tell your wife, this is how it's going to be. I don't know about your wife, but when I hear that, whoo -hoo, that is not how it's going to be at all. That does not fly <laughs> in our household. No. Yeah. So, <laughs> but when you say this is where we're at, this is what I'm thinking. What is your opinion? What do you think about this? It starts a conversation and it isn't you against her. It's the two of you against the world. I love and it. And I think you guys are going to kick the world's butt. I hope so. <laughs> We, we hope to be, uh, you know, out in Maui, just like uh, Beardy Brandon in the next, uh, I don't know how many years, but that's, that's our goal. That's for sure. Maui awesome. is a uh, beautiful place. I think it's sunny there today. <laughs> Certainly not New Jersey weather. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, this has been super fun. I really appreciate your time and I really appreciate you reaching out and asking us to review your finances because I think this is going to be helpful to a lot of people who are in a similar position. I really appreciate your time, guys. It was a pleasure and uh, keep up the great work. Okay. Thanks, Wayne. And we'll talk to you soon. Happy New Year. Take care, guys. Happy New Year. Thank you. Okay, Scott, that was Wayne Lux. What did you think of this episode? Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think it, I think it's just fun to... to it's what a privilege you and I have, Mindy, where we get access into the complete financial pictures of of folks, and we get to kind of just understand what's going in there, look for the leverage points, and and try to point out those things uh, and share our learnings over time with that. It's just so much fun to hear this this kind of stuff and figure out how we can help help folks. I think I think a lot of people are in are, are in Wayne's situation or close to it or within a few years. And to hear about the problems he's going through with really what is a rock solid approach to personal finance, um, I think is really is really eye-opening to a lot of folks. I think it will be really, really helpful for people to listen to the different aspects of different people's finances. I think everybody listening can learn something from everybody that we showcase on the Finance Fridays. Yep, absolutely. So if you enjoyed today's episode and you're interested in looking at more, we're going to post Wayne's uh, portfolio information and some of the details around that to, and he's going to give a little bit of context around that to the bigger pockets forums. You just go to biggerpockets.com slash forums, and it'll be one of the pinned um, top topics on there. And for the entirety of today, Friday, uh, January 1st, you'll be able to find that and go and look at what other investors around the community are are saying about Wayne's um, portfolio and what and next steps that you should be taking. So go check that out at biggerpockets.com slash forums. We'll also link to the specific thread in the show notes so that if you're listening to this later, you can go back and review it. And those show notes can be found at biggerpockets.com slash moneyshow158. Scott, should we get out of here? Let's do it. From episode 158 and the new Finance Friday, I am Mindy Jensen and he is Scott Trench and we are saying adieu, cockatoo. <laughs>